Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Post, and in this video I'm going to talk about a concept that I've, I've used this term before and I'm not sure it's always well understood, so I'm going to get into it a little bit in, in the video to help explain what I mean and how this applies to you. And that is the notion of a design approach versus a software approach. So when we're designing a home theater, there's kind of two approaches you can take. One is what I call a design approach. Design approach means we engineer the overall system to meet a certain design that allows for an end result that we're, that we're looking for. So the speaker placement is optimized at the outset. We don't just place them where they can go, what's convenient, we place them in particular locations that yield the best performance. That's obvious. I think most people think, well, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Where this becomes less obvious and why I use the term is the design approach aspect of building the room and the base. So it's not, I put the subwoofers wherever they can land and then I fix it later in the software. That's the software approach. It's I place them in particular locations that will yield the results I'm going for and then I have less I have to do in the software. So with the two new room correction systems coming out and having a little bit of hands-on time with both of them, I'm able to have reinforced, if you will, the value of design versus software approaches. In the past, software fixes for poorly placed subwoofers were so complicated that in many cases it was just obvious you had to do a design approach. And when these new systems came out, it seemed like that might have shifted things towards a software approach of, well, like with direct art, place the subwoofers wherever you want, wherever they go, good enough, and it's gonna work its magic and you're gonna get perfect bass. And we've done that on a number of occasions and the results were not perfect. And there were issues, and the, the thing was it wasn't Dirac's fault. It wasn't that the Dirac art program was working wrong or was screwed up. I mean, there might, have, there might be some little issues they can work out in there, but that wasn't the core of what was wrong. The core of what was wrong was a design approach hadn't been taken, the speakers were not in optimal locations, and so there was just nothing the software could do to fix it, even with all of its sophistication. It doesn't mean it didn't fix some of it, it didn't make it better than it was had we done nothing, but it didn't make it as good as it could have been. And so with waveforming, that was the whole concept from day one, was design approach, software being used after the design approach was taken, and that the end result would then be the best it could be. And we've been playing around with the idea of using a, a more of a software approach with it, of put the subwoofers where they can go, then see what it does, and let's see if the results are better than not. And what I'm finding so far is that there's just a lot of value to that design approach. It doesn't mean that, again, it doesn't mean that it's not working and it's not working better than nothing. What it means is that you're leaving so much on the table by not starting with that design approach that it seems like you really are better off going back and saying, okay, how can I configure this room? So actually both of those softwares will work with base arrays and base arrays do a lot to help out. So there's a couple ways, let's just start with direct art. There's a couple ways direct art can work well and there's lots of ways that direct art can work poorly. The way that it's gonna work poorly is if you have one or two subwoofers, you don't have any extra subwoofers for support purposes, and you're relying on a small number of mediocre, and I don't mean that in a mean way, I'm just saying m most are, mediocre surround speakers that just don't have a lot of bass and don't have a lot of dynamic range and just hoping it can do its best. That's a bad approach. And the end result may be better than what it would have been had you done nothing, but it's not gonna be great. Now, here's the other thing you could do, and it's one of the unique things direct art can do that waveforming can't do that's kind of a cool approach. And if it makes you feel better, you'd be doing something that Keith Yates has been doing in his systems for years, um, and it's sort of a cool way to go about it. You put in your main subwoofers that are used for output, basically, in the front of the room. They can be in an array, they can be on the floor. It doesn't really matter as much, but the array does have some advantages, so doing a proper array could be good. For the sake of argument, maybe you don't have the budget for a ton, so you do 218, which is still pretty crazy, and you stick those in the corners, which is fine. And they could even be on the floor, it's okay. Then, around the room, at different locations, at different heights, which is really critical, you have smaller, less capable subwoofers. They still need to be, ideally, everything should probably be sealed or ported. I would prefer sealed, but as long as they're all the same, that's gonna work best. They're placed at different locations on the walls, maybe even on the ceiling, and their primary purpose is not bass. It's like counteracting bass, 
those are going to be your support speakers. So you're not really using the surround speakers for support now. You're using bass speakers. The reason for that is their bandwidth and dynamic range is closer to that of the subwoofers than your surround speakers are. So it's going to do a better job. It also allows you to put them at more locations, and you can still use the surround speakers as support speakers. They just don't have to do as much, and you're relying more on these other speakers. So that's adding a design approach to direct art. In my opinion, it's, it's actually what it should have been all along. Now let's take the other approach. You could actually copy the waveforming concept with direct art, and it would still work pretty OK. So you could do uh, four subarray, for instance, on the front. You come in one, corner, uh, one quarter of the room's width to the left and the right, one quarter up from the bottom and down from the ceiling. You place that up on the wall. Those are your emitters. They're your main base speakers. They're producing the vast majority of your output. On the back wall, you could probably get away with two at the midpoint, one quarter in from the left and the right side, but midpoint in the height, run direct art, and you will actually get better results than had you just placed them haphazardly around the room. <clears throat> we have not actually done much testing with this. This is all based on our knowledge of how the algorithm works and the theoretical concepts that all this relies on. There's no reason why it shouldn't work, but this is one of the things we're now going to be testing so that we can get into it. And I think we need to test all of these different iterations to try to figure out which of the different design approaches work best with which of these systems. Waveforming can't, so Trinov's approach, can't have you place subwoofers just randomly, around, not randomly, but like up around the walls and everything and have it do its thing. It's, I shouldn't say it can't. It wasn't designed for that. It's possible because the way when you set it up, what you do is you basically establish which are emitters and which are not. So you could have your subwoofers in the front that are your emitters, and you could have subwoofers all around the room that are not, and it's possible that that actually would work okay. It needs to be tested, so that's to be determined. But the way the algorithm is expecting things and the way it was designed, so what we think at least is the right approach, would be some sort of an array in the front, some sort of an array in the back. It doesn't have to be like 20 subwoofers. It can be as little as two in the front, two in the back. It can be four in the front, two in the back. That's All that works. You get better results as you add more subwoofers, but in and of itself, that's this is pretty okay. But one of the interesting things with waveforming is that you can potentially place them pretty far off from where they're supposed to be and still get very, very good results. However, if you use a completely haphazard approach, they're on the floor and they're in the corners or in random locations, waveforming isn't going to work very well. You might get a very nice, even base, but it's going to vary in level quite a bit seat to seat. So, you know, there's you're not getting better seat to seat uniformity because you're not able to take advantage of its core. And it gets back to that it's not a, a limitation of waveforming, it's a limitation of any software approach. You're always better off starting with a design approach. So, in the same, I mean, this is true across the board with home theaters. If your room is a completely open concept room and you can't play side surrounds and back surrounds on the walls and they have to go in the ceiling, then there's nothing you can do. No software is going to fix that it will always be compromised. And we've gotten, I think, so used to thinking about how there's an optimal placement for speakers for the best sound, but not thinking as much about the optimal placement of subwoofers and relying so heavily on these DSPs that we've kind of lost the notion that the design approach applies across the board. You know, if you've got a cathedral ceiling, for instance, and it's really tall, it can be kind of hard to get Atmos in the right way. It doesn't mean it can't be done, but it can be tricky to get them at the right angles and positions to sound right, and you have to work with that. If you have, as I said, no sidewalls, or you have sidewalls in one location but not another, or you have glass walls or whatever, it can compromise the ability to put surround speakers where they need to go. All of this creates issues that basically need to be addressed in some way. And it may be that you can't, and it's a compromised room, and you can't take a, a design approach in the first place. And so you do your best with a, we'll call it a basic design approach, and then you let the software do what it can. Uh, the most sophisticated remapping software on the market is Trinov's. I probably should do a dedicated video on that. Maybe I'll do a really casual one and then do something more sophisticated later on. But I've played with it a ton. I have it in my system, and so I can play with it there. But I've also used it in a lot of systems. And what I can tell you is, the systems that are most compromised and need software help the most are the ones for which this can do the least help. In other words, when it needs it most, it's least effective. And when it needs it least, it's most effective, if that makes sense. So if the speakers are a little off, the remapping can help reorient things so that the balance is a little better. 
in my room, things are a little off. I actually don't use the remapping, but I've tried it and it sounds perfectly transparent. There's an ever so slight shift, arguably for the better. I'd have to probably listen to more content to be absolutely certain of that, but there is an audible shift at least when you turn on 2D remapping, which is getting these speakers more balanced. And what happened was the studs on these walls are different from each other. So the placement on the left and the right side are offset from each other by six inches. The side surrounds one farther back by six inches than the other. Not a big deal. It's actually not that noticeable. But like I said, when you kick in this remapping, it made a slight audible difference. I've not watched enough movies to be absolutely confident that it sounds substantially better. I just, you know, you can hear it clicking on and off basically. Um, the, some people's speakers, the left, center, and right heights are a little bit different or they're too tall or something like that, or maybe they're too low, whatever. So sometimes it helps. I've heard it where the left and the right speaker are the correct height, the center channel is a horizontal one below like a TV, and it's a little too low, and it brings up the center image nicely in that scenario, helps with that. I have a client though who had it over the TV, over the fireplace, it was way too high, it was probably like eight or nine feet off the ground, and the left and the right speakers were the correct height, for like listening positions. So we're talking tweeters maybe 40 inches off the ground, not even like 35 inches off the ground. Guess what? That didn't work. It, it actually turned off the center channel because it realized the center channel was so far off that a phantom center would have, would have been a better approach. Um, I've, I've tested it in a number of systems like that, you know, where it like it turns off some of the surround speakers too. They're in the wrong location and then you turn it on and you're like, this is making it worse. And so what I learned after having used it enough times was that in those scenarios with the most compromised speaker layouts, attempting to use sophisticated 3D mapping doesn't work. There is no real solution. It's just a, it's a compromised system. The solution is a design approach, meaning you start from scratch with a better room. That's the only way to fix it. Or you accept the compromises, which is what most people do, and it's fine. So that's, that's basically design versus software. Hopefully this is helpful. Now I'm probably going to shoot a video on the 3D remapping and turn off. So, thanks for watching my videos. Subscribe to my channel. Comment below. Always appreciate it.